This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. The question this time is the question Highwood. Uh, Highwood is from June 2011. It's question two in the exam, and it's the F7 exam again. Uh, I don't have a Kaplan nor a BPP question reference for this. Uh, I've downloaded the question from the ACCA website, and um, we'll see if we can get it done in... 45 minutes. Uh, it's 13.53 at the moment. I'm just not going to do that. What I'm going to do is just show you a little a little bit of something. It's, it's called exam technique, really. And it's not time allocation. You remember time allocation. Time allocation is if it's a, a 17 mark question. I multiply by 2, that gives me 34. If I take off 10%, that gives me 30.6, and that's the number of minutes. Uh, and that's a quick and easy way. You can do it without your calculator. Anyone surely can multiply by 2 and can take off 10%. So this is the, the time allocation. It's very sensible. It works on the principle of 100 marks times 2 is 200. And take off 10% is 180, and that's minutes, and 180 minutes minutes as you know is three hours and that's the time of your exam so I wasn't going to mention time allocation I wasn't going to do that again because those of you that know me are sick of me saying it on uh, in lectures and those of you that don't know me were probably sick of hearing me say it in lectures no what I was going to do is um, show you the importance of, of attempting every part of, of the questions that you select to do and at F level you have no choice but at P level you do have a choice so bear this in mind um, of, of every question that you elect to do at P level and of every question anyway at F level uh, it is important that you make an effort any effort anything at all is better than nothing at all and I'm just going to show you there this is my just imagine this is my answer booklet in the exam and I've got uh, question two in front of me and I write the question number in the top left hand margin of the the booklet to indicate to the marker which question it is and if that's all I've done there's the there's the booklet there's the the left hand margin there's the right hand margin I mustn't write in the margin areas but if there's nothing else that's it how many marks can a marker give me and I'm not giving the marker any opportunity to give me credit for even the bits that I don't know but I guessed or worked out or or just anything but if I don't put anything on my answer paper the marker cannot give me any credit and anything at all within that page anything at all any any deviant thought anything which came into your head and then you're sitting there thinking no that can't be right that can't be. it doesn't matter it's better than nothing so just because even if you know it's wrong it's still better than nothing because there's the possibility that the marker may say to himself well yes and I understand that English is not the student's first language it's not their native language and and I think I can possibly work out what the student is trying to say and it's not an English exam I'm not going to penalize the student for the wrong or the, the use of the wrong word or spelling or grammar I'm not going to penalize them for that so anything just put anything but don't leave your page blank now the other thing is that if you if it's a 30 mark question and you know nothing this is 54 minutes and you know nothing then we're really struggling you don't deserve to pass anyway because if it's a 30 marker it's a major part of the syllabus and if you can't think of anything at all to say then you really don't deserve to pass but it's not likely to be is it hopefully it's only going to be maybe a um, part C for instance it's maybe only going to be five marks five marks is nine minutes 
that you should be spending on this this question. What I suggest you do, typically a five marker will be a written part, and particularly in F7, if it's only five marks, even ten marks, in the question five, it might just be purely written. What I suggest you do is you take the number of marks and you divide by two, and that's your planning time in minutes. That's two and a half minutes to plan. And you're trying to find five things to say. Five separate, clear, markable points, relevant points. And five minutes, you know, five minute marks is, is nine minutes, and you've just taken two and a half minutes up in planning. So you've only got six minutes, six and a half minutes to write, and that gives you the nine minutes total. That's writing time. Oh, ring. Look at writing time. So you've just taken two and a half minutes, you've thought of five things, you've got these five things to put into sentence form. Only one sentence each, that's all you need. Put into sentence form, and you've got six and a half minutes to do it. Well, six and a half divided by five is 1.3 minutes. Per, well, i will say per paragraph these five points that you've thought of, you can put them into paragraph form, but you effectively, you know, one point equals one paragraph. Don't combine them. Separate paragraphs or separate points. And what I'm effectively saying is that one paragraph equals one sentence. And one sentence, therefore, is not more than, say, two lines length. A two-line sentence. That's all. Don't hammer it. Don't belabor it. Don't go on and on and on and on and on about making the same point. It's only worth one mark. And while you're taking, while you're writing four lines or ten lines to make that one mark, you're stealing time from these other easier points. So that's what I would suggest. You've got to write something. That's a little bit of exam technique, which has no relationship at all to Highwood. Um, but it's something that you could be thinking about because you're approaching, you're doing F7 now, you're approaching the time when you're going to be looking at uh, the P-level papers. And the P-level papers, you're going to have choices, and you're going to have lots and lots and lots of writing in P-levels. So it's worth thinking about. Anyway, I um, want to look at Highwood. I've got the uh, printed out papers in front of me, and the time is actually 40. I'll put 14.02, and we'll start when it is 14.02. Uh, oh, I've got another 40 odd seconds. <coughs> oh, while we're waiting, can you tell me what the time allocation is for um, 23 marks? 23 marks, what's the time allocation? Come on, quickly. Come on. 23 marks is... 23 times 2 is 46. Take away 4.6, it's 41.4 minutes. And the time is still 14.01. Oh, it's getting there. Okay. We're getting up to uh, the time when I'm going to start. 14.02 is start time. And we're about to kick off. There we go. Right. Highwood. Second part of the second page of the question. Well, the requirement for store statement of comprehensive income, changes in equity, financial position, answers to the nearest pair, a thousand. Notes are not required. There is time allocation there, but I'm hoping that we'll finish it within 45 minutes. Point number six. As usual, starting with the the uh, last points, well, we sold trade receivables at a book value. If received an immediate payment, we'll pay two percent on any uncollected balances. Any of the factored receivables outstanding after six months will be refunded to Easy Finance. Ah, the risks and rewards of ownership have not been transferred. This is a uh, an off-balance sheet substance over form, it's not off-balance, a substance over form situation, although we've sold other receivables, we've not actually made the sale. Uh, 
We've de-recognized the receivables, that is, we've credited the receivables, and we've charged 1.3 to admin. If we'd not factored them, we would have had an, uh, an allowance of 600,000. Okay, well, in this situation, I find it easiest to, to see what they have done. And what they've done is this, they've debited cash, what is it, 8.7. And we've credited receivables with 10, we've de-recognized the receivables, and we've put the missing 1.3 into admin, and of course all this is wrong. Okay, because the risks and rewards of ownership have not been transferred. Substance over form is a classic example, one of the classic examples, where it, we say it's a sale and in fact it's not a sale. Um, we've not got rid of these receivables, they are still ours. And so I'm going to have to reverse this, I'm going to have to recreate the receivables. So really what I can do, I, I can reverse this, I can say credit cash, credit admin and debit receivables. Or I can alternatively identify what they should have done and then try and get from here down to here, should have done. They should have debited cash. So you see there's no point in, in reversing that 8.7. Uh, we should have not touched receivables, we should have credited a loan account with uh, 8.7. That's what we should have done. Uh, and this was done on the last day, isn't it? This was done on the 31st of March. So there's no accrual to make of 2% per month on any uncollected balances. We're not given that information anyway. Uh, any of the factored receivables still outstanding after six months will come back to us. So that's it. That's all we should have done. So that cash entry is correct. What I need to do is reverse these two. So to get from here to here, I need to... The debit receivables 10, credit admin 1.3, and credit the loan account with 8.7. And that's what I'm going to do now in my question paper. Receivables, receivables is there, 47.1 plus 10,000. Credit the admin, second figure up from the bottom, minus 1.3, and create, I'm going to write in underneath loan interest, loan. 8, 7 as a liability. Okay, now then, we're not quite finished with point number one because if we hadn't done this, we would have raised an allowance of 600. So I need to uh, debit income statement with um, bad debt movement, bad and doubtful debts, and credit, that's uh, 600,000, and credit. He says, what's the nearest thousand? Oh, 600, yeah, okay, 600,000. And credit receivables. Oh, think about working to the nearest million. Okay, again, I'm going to put this into my uh, answer before I forget. Receivables minus 600. And the retained earnings. I'm going to put in retained earnings minus 600. Uh, does it go retained earnings or admin? Could go to admin, I suppose. I'm going to keep it separate. Hang it, show them the marker that I know what it is. Okay, that's point number six. Point number five, inventory. We got a 31st March year end. And we had some inventory. And this was not counted until the 4th of April. And its value was 36 million. And I've got to find this figure. Between the year in March and 4th of April, we've got received goods and we've got sold goods. And we're getting back here. We had received a delivery at 2.7. And we'd made sales of 7.8 at a markup on cost. We need to adjust that cost plus profit is selling price. It's a 30% markup, so cost is 100. 130% is the selling price. So the cost is 100 130ths of 7.8 million. Uh, that's 6 million, isn't it? 
So we've sold six million. Whatever that figure was, we've now received 2.7 and we've sold six. Neither the goods delivered nor the sales made in the period were included in purchases as part of cost of sales or revenue as part of sales. Okay, so we have a, a subtotal here. Where is it? We have a subtotal here which when I take off 6 will give me 36 and that's got to be 42 and this figure when I add 2.7 will give me 42 so that must be 39.3 mustn't it? Just let me check it now 39.3 is what I had in March then I received 2.7 gets me to 42 and I sold 6 and that gets me down to 36 so that's the correct inventory figure we have used that figure in our calculations and we should have used 39.3 okay so what I need to do then to adjust for this is I need to increase inventory on the statement of financial position by 3.3 and I need to decrease cost of sales on the statement of income by 3.3 and I'm just going to write that in as well before I forget it inventory I've got 36 here I'm going to put plus 3.3 cost of sales minus 3.3 .3. okay and that's point number five point number four is our favorite point number four this is <laughs> two marks in the bag deferred tax current tax uh, do we have any figures brought forward do we have any tax here we have two figures we've got a current tax brought forward I need a straight edge on this Current tax brought forward of 800 and deferred tax brought forward of 26. Okay, that's the opening position. Um, it will tell me, yes, it's an, this 800 is an over or under provision. Do I care? <laughs> Do I really care? I don't care. Actually, it's an over provision from last year. I'll show you. I'll show you. Uh, last year we had provided 20 million this year we paid cash of that figure and then we had a carry down of eight which gives me a brought down of eight and that's where I am now the brought down figure of 800 on the credit side that means I must have paid cash of 19.2 in settlement of a 20,000 liability so 20,000 was an over provision by 800 okay but I don't need to know all I need to know is that it's brought down on the credit side and I've got a brought down credit of the deferred tax and I am told point number four the required provision this year is 19.4 and I'm going to bring that down that's my current liability 19.4 the difference between the carrying amounts of the net assets including the revaluation of property and their lower tax base is 27 million at 25 percent is um, 6.75 so I'm going to carry down 6750 and bring down 6750 now then I'm going to get rid of that I've got a movement here of 4150 but some of it relates to the revaluation of property so the bit that relates to revaluation is going to go to a revaluation reserve and only the rest is going to go to current tax so I can balance off the account I know that the, the missing figure is uh, 4150 but some of it's going to go to revaluation and only some of it is going to go to the current tax okay but I can't fill that in until I do the um, revaluation and it's here in note number three so we can do that note number three on the 1st of April that's on the first day of the accounting period we decided for the first time to value our freehold property at current value qualified value were reported market value 
have I got land on buildings? I do. I've got freehold property, land and buildings. Land was 25, buildings was 50, and this was as at 1st of April 2005. Okay, and we've depreciated. Brought forward, we've got depreciation of 10. So our building is now 40, our land is 25, and that's where we're at at the moment. And a qualified valuer reports the market value of the pre old property is 80. At the moment it's only 65, of which 30 is land. So we've got a revaluation of 5, puts me to 30. The total is 80, so that must be... 50, yeah, oh, i tell you what we haven't done, we've not depreciated, I've got to depreciate this 40 for another year, ah, we bought it in 05, a qualified property value reported that the market value of the property was 05, and why am I going to this was 80? It was 30 minutes. At this date, the remaining estimated life of the property was 20. And I've got 10,000 depreciation on the building. I bought it April 5, so that's April 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's five years, so it's 2,000 a year. So I need to depreciate by 2,000 for this year. That brings it down to 38. And now I'm... Am I doing this right? No, I'm not. I don't need to depreciate it. It's stupid. It's simply a revaluation of 10. Up to 50. So I've got a revaluation, a credit revaluation reserve of 15. And I've got a debit of 15 into the land and buildings. Now I've got to depreciate. This date, the remaining estimated life was 20 years. So I now need to depreciate that by 50 divided by 20 is two and a half. That gives me 47.5 and 30 for the land. That's 77.5 for land and buildings. And I'm going to put that into my figures now. Revaluation reserve. Do I have one? No, we don't. So I need to create a revaluation reserve of 15,000 and put 15,000 on, take 10,000 off the depreciation and add 5,000 onto the property. That gives me 80,000 and then put 2,500 into depreciation. So 77,500. Okay. Now then, just think back, will you, to this deferred tax problem, because I've got deferred tax on this revaluation. I've got 15,000 revaluation. Tax rate is 25%. 25% of 15,000 is 3,750. So 3,750 of this movement, 3,750 of this movement needs to go to the revaluation reserve. That gives me 6,350, so only 400 is going to go to the current tax account. And now I can balance that, that's 19,008, 19,008, and that gives me 19,000 to go to the income statement. And I'm going to put that into my question paper now. Income tax, current tax, 19,000 as a debit, as an expense, and 19,004 as the liability. So 19,004 deferred tax, let's cross out 26, and that gives me the uh, 6750. I think I've dealt with the pre property. Now I've got a plant. PPE, and again, you'll notice that the building, land and buildings are depreciated straight line. Plant is being depreciated, re reducing balance. He always, I'm going to write it down because you may not believe me, he always does this. There's going to be two different depreciation rates. One will be straight line and one will probably be reducing balance, but it could be some of the digits. Most unusual, it could be machine hour method 
Um, or it could simply be uh, arbitrary on the basis of usage and the director's number of units produced, for instance. But machine hour is the straight line will be used. Reducing balance probably will be used and these are the, the fringe areas which are very rarely seen in practice and rarely seen in the exam but they do occasionally come in. So uh, just beware that you apply the correct um, base for the depreciation. Plant is depreciated 20% per annum on the reducing balance. Plant was 74,500 cost, reduced by depreciation of 24,500. He always actually does this as well. He always makes it a very nice and straightforward calculation. That's 50,000 and it's depreciated at 20%. That's 10,000 depreciation. So I'm going to put that in my question. Plus 10,000 against the plant depreciation, so 24,5 plus 10 and 10,000 is going to go to cost of sales, so cost of sales is plus 10,000 uh, and 2,500 was the depreciation wasn't it there, uh, which I've just written onto my question paper, and that's that done. Now we're getting into a tricky one, uh, point number two, don't like point number two, I'm going to do point number one instead. Again that's um, exam technique, if you don't like the look of something leave it and do something which is easier. Equity dividend of five cents was paid in November 10. There, just looking at point two to make sure there was no share issue in point number two. So five cents per share. How many shares? Be careful, it's not 56,000, that's the dollars, they're 50 cents each, so times 2 will give me the number of shares and then times 5 cents. So 56,000 times 2 times 5 is the same as 56,000 times 10, and 56,000 times 10 is 5, 6. It's just a question now, putting as many zeros behind us makes it look reasonable, $5,600. It's been charged to retained earnings. It shouldn't have been. Retained earnings is 1.4 per the question. We need to add that 5.6 back. 7,000 is the brought forward retained earnings. And then, if we were to do, are we? Yes, we are doing statement of changes. So we've got 7,000 brought forward and then minus 5,600 dividend. Okay, that's point number one. So point number two, uh, looks like um, it's a convertible loan, it's a mixed instrument, it's an 8% loan, it was issued on the first day of the accounting period at par, so we debited cash and credited the loan, that's what we have done, debited cash, credit loan 30,000 and that's the figure which is in the trial balance, I'm just going to have a quick drink of coffee, excuse me. You keep on reading. Interest is payable annually in arrears. Keep going. It's redeemable on 31st March 2013 uh, or convertible into equity at the option of the loan 30 shares for every 100. Finance director has calculated that to issue an equivalent loan note without the conversion rights, would have to pay interest at 10%. Alright. Let's see, it's a it's a compound instrument or a mixed instrument. And the way to look at this is to say, well, it's worth thirty million. Some of it is loan and some of it is equity. Now we can either value the loan and then the rest is equity, or we can value the equity and then the rest is loan. Or we can value both and if it's greater than 30 then we'll, we'll pro-rata them uh, on the basis of how much each element is. But you know it's difficult to value equity. If you can value equity shares, if you can tell me what the value of equity shares is going to be in three years time, uh, then I'm going to give up teaching. I'm just going to take your advice and buy some shares which you tell me are going to have a value substantially greater in three years time. Difficult actually to value equity isn't it? So let's value the loan. We need the present value of the loan. It was issued on the 1st of April at par and so we've got 8% of 30 million. 8% of 30 million is 2.4 
and that's going to be paid on 31.3.11 today actually and then we've got the same again on 31.3.12 and the same again on 31.3.13 so 2.4 will be paid in a year's time and 2.4 will be paid in two years time as also will the 30 million and I want to find what is the present value of this obligation. At the date of issue, the time of issue, which was 31.310, 1st of April, this should have been discounted at 0.91, and this should have been discounted at 0.83, this should have been discounted at 0.75. A 0.75 of that is uh, 24,300. I can do that in my head. Uh, but I can't do these others. Actually, I probably could, but I'll do it properly. 2,4 times 0.91 is uh, 2184 and 2.4 times 0 0.83 is 1992 so this is the value the present value of the loan the present value of the obligation um, that gives me what is it Six, seven, four, eight, twenty-eight, four, seventy-six, and the face value is thirty million. So a year ago, when we issued this, we should have credited equity with this one five two four. We should have credited the loan with twenty-eight four seventy-six, and we should have debited cash. This is what we should have done a year ago. So although it says the loan is there at 30 million, it should actually only be there at 28,476. Now, let's look at that loan. If it were there at 28,476, it's got a 10% interest, realistic, effective rate, and that's 2848. Okay. And that then gives me 31,324. And we've actually paid, that's 10% for the year to 31,311, which is our year. That's the income statement expense. And we've paid 2.4. So now that's 28,924. And that's the statement of financial position. That's the loan figure for the statement of financial position. Now, Beyond the question, this is nothing to do with the question. I'll just show you how it does continue to work. Ten percent gets me to thirty-one three twelve. That's two eight nine two thirty-one eight one six, and I pay two four. That gives me to twenty-nine four one six, and then two nine four one gets me to thirty-two three fifty-seven, and I pay two four, which is as near as damn it, isn't it? It's just as near as damn it, 30 million, which I'm going to pay on the 31st of March 2013. So that's how it's working. That's that's the intention. That's that's the basis of uh, Steve Scott's story about this loan. Right, that's already in the trial balance. That's what the figure should be for the finance costs. So I need to add 448, and that is going to increase finance charges, and it's going to increase the loan. So the loan should now be 28,924, and the finance charges should be 2,848, and I'm going to put those now into my question. 2,400, the last figure in the trial balance, plus 448. And the 30,000, the third figure in the trial balance credit side, it should be 28,924. 28,924. And the other missing figure is this, um, this equity. That's not in this. I'm going to write that in as well. I'm just going to write equity. 1524. And that now deals, and that's it. Crikey, we're done already. Okay, that's a statement of income. Revenue. Revenue. There's no change in the revenue. And again, get your straight edge out because it's too easy to misread the figures. Cost of sales was 207,750. Do we have a minus 3,300? What was minus 3,300? 
Oh, it was the inventory, wasn't it? Minus 3,300, because we did the inventory on the wrong date. And then we got the 10,000 depreciation and 2,500 depreciation. So that's um, 219, 220,000, It's all right. Just check those additions, really. I think it's 216,950. Uh, that gives me one twenty two seven hundred. And before I forget, I'm going to take off my provision for doubtful debts, which was what uh, six hundred, wasn't it? That's one hundred and twenty two one hundred. Okay, one hundred and twenty two one hundred. Okay. Distribution costs twenty seven five. Admin expenses it was thirty thousand seven, but I've got. Um, 1300 in there, haven't I? What was the 1300? Do you remember? What was the 1300 admin expense? 1300, 1300, 1300. Oh, yes, it was the um, factoring. The missing figure from the factoring 29,004. There will be finance charges, I know that. So it's 2400. Plus the additional 448 that we've just worked out. Um, don't think there's anything else. No other. So 2848. Any sundry bits of income? No. No sundry bits of income. Okay. 40. Uh, 4958. 59, Two three fifty two. Okay, that's PBT tax. I know I've written it in here. Where have I written it? Tax there nineteen thousand. Uh, so forty three three fifty two. That's profit after tax. Now there's been some um, bits and pieces of movement, hasn't there? There's been a gain on the property. Um, and the gain on the property was revenue reserves of 15,000 but there was deferred tax on the property gain of 3,750 so the net gain is 11,250 54,602 it's a strange figure Anyway, we'll have to carry on. Does he want a statement of changes? Yes, he does. A statement of changes in equity. We've got shares. What else do we have? Uh, we don't have a premium. We've got retained earnings. We have a revaluation reserve. We've got no other equity, haven't we? Oh, nearly forgot. Other equity and a total column. The shares, there was no share issue, so brought forward of 56. Retained earnings was the 1,004, but I've had to add back the 5,600 um, for the dividend. Re revaluation reserve, there wasn't one, because we revalued for the first year. Other equity, there wasn't one, so 63,000 is the total. Now then, we've got the uh, mixed instrument. And that was what, one, five, I'm, I'm going to check it. Mixed instrument, one, five, two, four. And we got the revaluation, which was 15, but there was deferred tax on the revaluation, and that was 3750. Okay, there's a dividend, wasn't there? 5,600. And that 5,600, that gives me the 1,400 retained earnings per the question. Uh, there was no change in share capital and no share premium, so 54,602 profit for year. 54,602. And I'm desperately thinking, have I missed anything? And I don't think I have. 
I don't think I missed anything. Oh, I know. 54602. It's stupid. I picked that figure up and I've already dealt with those. It's 43352. 43352. 43352. That was nearly, nearly a silly mistake. Still don't think I've missed anything, so I'm going to add it up. Nothing lost. 1400, that's 44752. Uh, 11250. 1524 and this one's an awkward one. I'm going to do this on the calculator. Plus 1524 plus 11250 minus 56 plus 43352. Oh, it should be 113526. 113526. Just check it, will you? Because I'm not very good on calculators. Statement of financial position. Freehold property. We've worked that out. Um, what did I say? It was 75 plus that is 70, 80,000, wasn't it? Minus 2,005, 77,500. Plants. Uh, did I write the plant figure in? I don't think I did. It was just 10,000, wasn't it? It was 50,000 minus the 10,000, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, just you should be checking this, you know, as I'm doing it because it's a bit difficult writing on a piece of glass and trying to remember everything. But I can't think of anything that I've missed, so I'm going to put 117500. Uh, and then I'm into current assets. Inventory was 36,000, but I've added 3.3, .3, so that gives me 39.3. Receivables was a, an adjustment as well. Forty-seven one plus the ten thousand because and minus the six hundred, so it's uh, fifty-seven one fifty-six five, isn't it? Fifty-six five hundred. Bank, uh, the bank is overdrawn. Um, three hundred ten twenty-three two ten eleven two one three three hundred. You remember that, Billy, really, because equity, and again, I'm going to shortcut it because, although, no, I'm not. Hang it. Shares, well, I should be able to do it properly, 56,000. Uh, retained earnings, 44,750. I'm just checking, but I've got the figures are at the top of the screen, so I'm writing them in whilst I can see them. 11,250 and 15,24. Okay, uh, that was retained earnings, that was revaluation reserve, and that was other equity. And that came to, I'll do the, the maths, 14, 15, 15, 24, 113, 524, 526. Because that's wrong, isn't it? Um, five one four. Yeah, forty four seven five two. That would have been difficult to see that because that was just a stupid mistake. Long term debt, long term liabilities. We've got the eight percent loan, and we've got the factored loan. And we've got deferred tax. 8% loan is, um, well, I've written it in and the workings are there. It's 28.924. And the factored loan was that 8.7? Where did I put that? 8.7. It's down on my uh, question paper. Deferred tax, I've also written in a 6.750. So that's my long term debt. Uh, 649, 14, 19, 28, to 10, 21, 27, to 157. And then current liabilities is the bank, 11.5. Payables, 24.5. Don't see anything else. Oh, tax. <laughs> it's 
actually written in there. Tax have written it into the question paper, 194. I'm glad I did as well, because otherwise I would have forgotten. Um, 96, this is not looking good. 10, 22, 2, 10, 19, 23, 10, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 9, 6. I'm four wrong somewhere. That's got to be a stupid mistake. Yeah, <laughs> look at that. Look at that for an addition. Two plus nothing plus four is two. That's six. Incredible. How can you do that? That's a zero and that's... Oh, it's looking like it should be a nine. Uh, 10, 24, 28 should be 900. And then that now is 300. 2, 10, 23, 2, 1, 3, 300. 2, 1, 3, 300. And the time is 14.38. Yeah, 36 minutes. It's hard. It, it, it is very, very difficult for an F7 student to finish these questions within a time allocation. It is difficult to do. It is a available. It is possible to do it. But the only difference between you and me, apart from age and nationality, maybe, the only difference is the fact that I'm a lot more experienced than you. Well, that's part of age, isn't it? And I've practiced it. I've practiced and practiced and practiced. Uh, and if you will, if you get to the situation where you know what to look out for and, and how to deal with it when you come across it, then you will find that you can do these questions comfortably within the time limit. I read an open tuition when people come out of the exams, exam feedback, how does Steve Scott expect us to do the exam in three hours? Anyone? I could only do question one and two, I didn't get through to doing question three. How, how can that be? And the answer is because you've not practiced. You've not gone over and over and over these standard workings and the, the, the way in which the questions are set out. If you'll do that, and you do it before the exam and you get some practice in, you will find it comes easy. And particularly, the bare minimum you should be doing is you should be working through those mini exercises. Don't think about going into that exam room without having done those mini exercises. 